Hey folks, this is JR with DIY Prepper. Welcome to the channel. A couple years ago, I did a video showing three different ways to make a Faraday cage using stuff that you probably already have laying around the house. And each one of those methods that I showed, they can do a really good job of protecting small devices from an EMP. But one thing that they don't do very well is protect larger things like generators and other backup power options. So today, I'm going to show you all how to build a Faraday cage that's large enough to protect those kinds of devices. I'm going to show you all how I built this one, along with things that I would do differently if I had to do it all over again, along with improvements I'll probably make in the future to make mine more effective. The main purpose of a Faraday cage like this one is to protect a generator from an electromagnetic pulse or EMP, specifically one caused by a high altitude nuclear detonation. That type of EMP consists of three separate emissions referred to as E1, E2, and E3. E2 and E3 are mainly a danger to the power grid and other large-scale technical infrastructure. E2 couples to long transmission lines like power lines and is a threat to anything connected to them, including any devices that you have plugged in at home. It's actually kind of similar to lightning. E3 will also affect power and communication utilities, but it won't be a threat to small electronics since it's low frequency and won't couple directly into them as long as they're not connected to the grid. The main threat to our small electronics and other non-grid connected devices is going to come from the E1 component of an EMP. E1 happens fast, it's very powerful, and it consists of higher frequencies, generally between 1 megahertz up to 1 gigahertz, and those can couple directly into those smaller devices. It could disrupt or even permanently damage things like radios, LED lighting, and even generators. Now I designed this Faraday cage to fit one of my larger solar power stations, specifically the EcoFlow Delta 3 Ultra or my Smart Generator 3000. The dimensions I use should also accommodate common inverter generators like the Honda EU2000i, and to do this I started by creating a wooden frame that'll serve as the body of the Faraday cage. I used 2x2s for the top and bottom and 2x3s for the vertical supports. I started by cutting four 32 inch links and four 17 inch links out of my 2x2s. When assembled that'll make the top and bottom 32 by 20 inches total. Then after that I cut eight 20 inch links out of my 2x3s. These will serve as my vertical supports. After I made my cuts, I went ahead and sanded each of the boards to remove any splinters or really rough areas. I wasn't trying to get them super smooth, I just didn't want any bad spots in the wood to damage the copper mesh that I used later on. When connecting the 32 inch and 17 inch links, I placed the two 17 inch pieces inside of the 32 inch pieces and connected them using screws and a corner jig. Connecting them in that way will give you the 32 by 20 inch dimensions that I mentioned just a second ago. After that, I used a pocket hole jig to place two pocket holes at each end of my 20 inch pieces. Using pocket holes is an easy way to connect pieces of wood together and it keeps the screws out of the way later on. After I drilled the holes, I used pocket hole screws to connect the vertical supports to the bottom frame. When doing this, I did my best to keep the vertical supports flush with the outside of the bottom frame to prevent ridges from forming on the outside of the structure because if you're not careful, those could eventually wear down the conductive material on the outside of the Faraday cage. Then once I got all the vertical supports connected to the bottom, I flipped everything upside down so that I could connect them to the top frame as well. And after I got the box put together, I went ahead and used a rasp to smooth out corners and any ridges that formed along the outside to further help protect the exterior of the Faraday cage. Then I started adding the mesh and for that I used some copper mesh that I found on Amazon and the reason why I chose copper is because it's one of the most conductive metals out there. It's actually second only to silver and I think it's pretty obvious that I'm not going to make a silver Faraday cage because that would just be ridiculous. But just like silver, copper has one valence electron which makes it very conductive. To connect the mesh to the Faraday cage's frame, I treated it sort of like wrapping a gift. I laid it on one side and let the roll hang down the next. I used copper cut tacks to secure the mesh in place and I did that for a couple of reasons. First, they're easy to drive into wood and they have a wide head that'll do a good job of holding the mesh into place without letting it tear out. Then since they're the same type of metal as my mesh, I don't have to worry about one corroding the other later on. 
After I got the first side done, I stretched out the mesh and secured it in the same way to the other two sides and then cut it off to leave one side open. That's the opening that we'll use to place the generator into the Faraday cage later on. Now when you're applying your mesh, you want it to wrap around the bottom on each side a little bit. That'll give you some overlap later on, which is a good thing when you're building a Faraday cage. Since my roll of mesh was 36 inches wide, I had a couple of inches hanging over the ends and to deal with those, I just folded them over and used some more copper cut tags to secure them to the frame. That way they'll be out of the way when I put mesh over those other sides and to apply mesh to those, I actually started at the middle of the top side and ran the mesh from there down to the bottom of one open side and just like before I used cut tacks to hold them in place and then I trimmed off the excess from the sides and bottom leaving a little bit of overlap on the sides and enough on the bottom so that I could wrap it around like I did earlier. Then I followed the same steps for the other side. I started at the top middle, ran the mesh down the last remaining open side, secured it in place, and then cut off the extra material. Now, just to be honest, I didn't originally plan to do two layers of mesh around the entire Faraday cage. I mainly did that on the top just because it made my life a little bit easier at the time. So because of that, I went ahead and covered the seams with copper tape. I chose this particular tape since it was four inches wide and had conductive adhesive. But after I finished taping all the seams and did some quick tests of the cage, I decided to add a second layer of mesh on the other sides also. It was doing a good job stopping radio signals, but wasn't doing jack against cellular or Wi-Fi. So I ended up having to order another not so cheap roll of mesh and another stinking roll of tape. Now you may have noticed in that clip that I showed a second ago that the cage was actually upside down and sitting on like a layer of copper mesh. And the reason why I did that, it, I was kind of taking inspiration from something that I saw here on YouTube where a guy built a box, wrapped it in aluminum screening, set it on another sheet of aluminum screening, and it made kind of like a Faraday cage that was easy to access the contents of, which I thought was cool. So I was going to take that idea and improve upon it, like by using copper screening. I was going to make a special gasket for it. But in that video, he only tested FM radio. And if you built a couple of Faraday cages, you might know that radio is one of the easiest things to block, like AM FM radio is. And he didn't test anything else out. So after I got it built, yeah, it stopped the FM radio just like his did, but it wasn't doing jack against cellular or Wi-Fi, which is obviously a problem. So to deal with that, I had to redesign the cage to accommodate an actual lid instead. It was one of those situations where instead of trying to find an easier way to do something, I should have just done it the way that I knew would work the first time. Like if you have something easy, like you've figured out a more efficient way to mow your lawn, then yeah, go for that. But if it's something like a Faraday cage that has a lot of science behind it where there are proven ways to do it effectively, then just stick with what you know works. Having designed and built a couple of Faraday cages in the past, I should have known better, but I tried it anyway. But after my next roll of expensive conductive tape arrived, I went ahead and made the gasket for the top of the Faraday cage. To do this, I used foam weather stripping as the core and wrapped it in foil tape. And this is actually similar to how some real conductive gaskets are made. They consist of a squishy core that's completely surrounded by conductive material. They're just a lot prettier than what I put together. I did each piece individually and then used more foil tape to connect the pieces together and secure the gasket to the rest of the Faraday cage. Then when my next roll of mesh arrived, I covered each side with another layer, nailed it down, and taped the seams again. I had enough mesh that I had saved for my first roll that I could use that to cover the inside of the lid. But before I could do that, I actually had to custom make the lid. And to do that, I used pieces of cardboard that I had saved from big honking boxes to be used as target backings for my other channel. I cut the large piece just a tiny bit bigger than the Faraday cage is opening and then made the sides a little wider than that. I used masking tape to keep it together while I played with exactly how big I wanted it to be. It needed to be a tiny bit wider than the top of the cage to accommodate the gasket, mesh, and tape I'd add later on. Once I got it where I wanted it, I used Gorilla Tape to connect everything together. I used it on the outside, bottom edge, and inside to make the lid as strong as possible. 
Then I added a couple of gaskets to the inside of the lid, and for this I used one quarter by half inch window seal. I put one gasket along the bottom inside edge of the lid and another going along the side. I covered both with more Gorilla Tape to protect them while the lid's being moved, because if you don't do that, the window seal will just peel off since its adhesive isn't very strong. After that, I attached the large piece of copper mesh that I had left over to the inside of the lid. I used small pieces of foil tape to secure the first part to the edges of the lid and then used double sided tape to secure the mesh to the bottom of the lid. Then I folded the mesh back over itself and continued to use small scraps of foil tape to get it in the right position. To prevent the second layer of mesh from drooping down, I doubled a few pieces of foil tape back over themselves to create some ad hoc conductive double sided tape. I didn't do that to the first layer since it was touching the cardboard lid, but I did want something conductive between the two layers of mesh. When I got it laid out, I used foil tape to cover the bottom edge of the lid and the mesh inside of the lid. Then after that, I added a bottom platform to the Faraday cage for the generator to sit on. I would have done this earlier in the process, but once again, I had to change the design on the fly, so here we are. And for that, I used particle board and cut it to accommodate the cage's structure secured it in place, and then placed a section from a rubber stall mat on top of that. And if you ever have to cut a rubber stall mat, don't try to use a knife like I did. It's just way too much work. Instead, use an oscillating multi-tool. I used one to trim a little bit off once I made my first cut to help it fit a little bit better, and that multi-tool did the job way, way better. But when I got done, the cage was able to stop radio signals along with cellular and Wi-Fi. To test the radio, I tuned it into a local NOAA weather station, and as soon as I shut the lid, the radio went straight to static. Then to test my cell phone, I set it inside the cage, shut the lid, and then tried to use the Find My Phone feature. I did that with Wi-Fi turned on and off, and it didn't work either time, and it also went straight to voicemail when my wife called me. So between those two tests, it showed that the Faraday cage does a decent job stopping things from at least 162 megahertz all the way to around 2.4 gigahertz or more, and a lot of frequencies in that range are what you would have to worry about if we were to experience an EMP. When I did my other video a couple years ago, some people thought that I was testing the phone to see if it would survive an EMP, which is not really the case. Instead, I was testing to see if it would stop frequencies by the phone because I obviously know that if there was an EMP, our cellular infrastructure would probably poop the bed. Now, to be fair, the frequencies used by cell phones, especially those for 5G, are a lot higher than what you'd expect for an EMP. To do a real test of a Faraday cage, you need lots of expensive equipment that very few people actually have. So it's one of those things where you just kind of do the best with what you have, the theory being that the more stuff that you can stop with it, then the better that it's probably working. Then there's some other questions that come up when I do videos like this one, and one of them is, what are you going to power? Because to be fair, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to go through the trouble of creating a Faraday cage for a power source if you don't have anything to power once an EMP wipes everything else out. And to answer that, a cage of this size could be used to protect other items as well, or you can build separate enclosures or buy individual Faraday bags for those. That can include things like flashlights, radios, and other small devices. I actually keep some of my older stuff that I don't use a lot in my trash can Faraday cage or in Faraday bags at all times so that if there is an EMP, I'll at least have something that I can use. Then after that, a lot of people will wonder why in the world would you save a gas generator if you're only going to use it until you run out of fuel? And for my Faraday cage, I designed it to accommodate either my smart generator or a large power station, and I'll probably just keep the power station in this one. But if you're somebody who has the ability to store a lot of gas on your property, then it could make sense. Like maybe you're a farmer and you have a big tank that you use, and you could just use gas from that. But there's also going to be fuel that could be scavenged, at least in the first few months after an EMP while that stuff is still good. And there are other ways to run a fuel-based generator. Like if you have somebody nearby that has the know-how of how to construct a wood gasifier, 
then you can modify the generator to run off of that. Then there's the issue of grounding. A Faraday cage does not need to be grounded to protect the devices inside of it. If a Faraday cage were to be struck by lightning, which is similar to the E2 component of an EMP, then electrical energy could accumulate on the outside of the cage. But the only time that E2 would be a problem is if the Faraday cage was connected to something that was connected to the grid. E1, which is mainly what we're concerned about with this, doesn't work that way. It's faster, has higher frequencies, and isn't really going to accumulate the same way that E2 would. In fact, if you had a long grounding wire attached to your Faraday cage, it could actually act sort of as an antenna and end up doing more harm than good. But having gone through this process, there are a lot of things that I would do different if I had to do this Faraday cage project over again. It was really expensive, and the performance that I got out of it wasn't much better than if I had used other less expensive materials. I paid $92 for the first roll of mesh, $37 for the second, $54 for three rolls of conductive tape, $18 for lumber, around $20 for copper cut tacks, $9 for pocket hole screws, $11 for the particle board, around $12 on window seals, $5 on double-sided tape, and around $34 on a rubber stall mat that I barely got any use out of, and that brings us to a grand total of the closest that I've ever come to using profanity on this channel ever. The first thing that I'd change is that I wouldn't use copper. It's just way too expensive and it's hard to find locally. That means that you're going to pay a lot to begin with and if you need to order more than what you thought you need, like I did, then you're going to have to pay a lot again and have to wait on it to get to you. Instead, I would just use heavy duty aluminum foil because it's a lot cheaper, it's easy to find locally, and it still works. You just have to use more of it to get the same results. It's what I used a couple years ago to cover a box that I have some solar panels in. When I did testing for that video, I found that three layers of heavy duty aluminum foil would stop cell signals, so I ended up using five for that box. Just overlap your sheets by several inches, go perpendicular to the previous layer each time you add a new one, and use foil tape to keep everything in place. I did not add a lid to that one, I just sealed it up like an electromagnetic tomb since those were spare panels that I never used, but you could do something similar with a lid if you wanted to. And since foil is more delicate, I would have went ahead and made my frame like I did for this one, but I would have secured cardboard to the outside for the foil to rest on, Doing that would also solve another problem that my cage has, and that's lid to cage overlap. Here I have less than two inches of overlap from the top of the cage to the bottom of the lid. I would have liked to have had a lot more, but the top of the frame structure only goes down about that far anyway because of the type of lumber I use, those two by twos. I could have made the lid go further down, but it wouldn't have had anything to press against after it went past that board anyway. Having a flat surface all the way down would have given me a lot more overlap and a better surface to rest against. I may actually end up covering my cage with cardboard and then wrapping that in aluminum foil or building a separate aluminum foil covered box to nest it in because that would basically give me two Faraday cages, and that's a really good approach to use. I already do that with some of my smaller devices. I keep them in a Faraday bag while they're being stored in my trash can Faraday cage. It gives them double the protection and a much better chance of surviving an EMP. Then I may also line the inside of my cage with cardboard, similar to what I did with my trash can Faraday cage. There is quite a bit of space between my generator and the side of the Faraday cage, but putting some cardboard in there is just a good best practice. Now, if you want to see full instructions for how I made a Faraday cage out of a cardboard box and aluminum foil, then click here. Or if you want to see what you should do immediately after an EMP, then click here. Thank you all for stopping by. Y'all have a good one.